cloud chamber bowls. <laughs> TJ Troy. I'm John Schneider. And we're here with the Cloud Chamber Bowls. So John, um, where did you start this process of creating and, uh, or I should say remaking and assembling this instrument? Everything starts with Harry Parch's recorded music. What is that sound? And then you find out it's the Cloud Chamber Bowls. What are they? You go to Genesis of the Music, there's pictures of them. And I found out that these used to be, well, if you can imagine, take this bottom and put it on that top, and you have an actual jug, right? They're known as carboys. They're used for collecting chemicals. In fact, one of these guys uh, was so, <laughs> these, these are, are used, here it is. It still has markers from a lab where we got it. These are actually etched in. Interesting. Do you know what the bowls, what they were used for at that lab? They are called cloud chamber bowls yeah. because they did cloud chamber experiments up in Lawrence Livermore Laboratories in Berkeley in the early, early 1950s. Interesting. Uh, they would put inert gases in there, plug them, and then shoot, I'm not sure what, and they would, mm. they would either do film or x-rays or something, they could see these particles going all sorts of places. And occasionally they would break. And Harry's uh, dear friend who worked there said, oh yeah, we've got these, these bowls. We use them as punch bowls after they break. He says, hey, can I try them? <laughs> so that was, uh, that was how he got excited about it. Mm. And of course the question is, how do you get it from a jug? How do you cut the darn things? Right. And the story goes that Harry Parch did, uh, this is amazing. He got a glass cutter and would roll it on the ground and score it so there's just a very thin scratch around right, the edges. Right. And then he got toaster wire, wrapped it around in that notch, walked over to the wall, twisted the ends, and stuck them in the socket. Interesting. So it would heat. It would glow red, just like a toaster, right? Right, right. And then he would have right next to it a, a big bucket of cold water or a bathtub and put it quickly into cold water and yeah, it would shatter it and, it would, sh and it would break right at that point. You know, you talk to different instrument makers who build um, percussion instruments, mallet percussion instruments, and generally they're going to work with wood and metal. There's all different types of woods that go into making the bars. But I've heard it said before, Craig Grady, who's a mutual friend of ours and another instrument builder, yeah. he said, none of these guys want to deal with glass because it's so volatile and dangerous. If you think about oh, it, God, if yeah. you're handling this and, you know, uh, some of these glass, I mean, you can look at, they all come at different gauges, <laughs> you know, and if you get one that's not been as well cast as before, mm. you run the risk of that shattering and maybe causing injury. Absolutely. You know? Well, the question, it, I know you're about to ask the question, yeah. so I'll answer it. Please. No, I did not stick my fingers into a socket. Right? What I did, I went to a professional glass cutter. Good. Okay. To a, a lab that makes these things. Excellent. And they actually put it on a lathe and used a torch and mm -hmm. spun it. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, they annealed it, which means they brought the temperature up 
until almost melting to so all these stress lines inside the glass yeah. would relax and they would be much less liable to break. Mm -hmm. It's so, tempered twice, in other words. Of course, of yeah. course. Now, it's obvious that these are all different sizes, just like, what, like a piano strings are a different length, right. or a vibraphone bars. So the question always comes, how do you tune these things? Yeah. And well, the answer is you don't. <laughs> well, with Harry Parch's music, we've, we've come to know the precision of intonation that made him very famous. Right? Yes. 43 tones that are not even symmetrical tones, right? They're, they're each differently spaced. So with such detail, you would think that he would try to dial the intonation of these instruments in to the same degree, but that wasn't the case. No, because he found as soon as he did that, uh, he got some beautiful tones, but then what? <laughs> okay. So he ended up listening to the tones and writing the music to match the tones that are in the bowls, rather than let the bowls match what his chromalodeon or any of his system right. was all about. And of course, they are glass, they do break, mm. and when they broke, he would have to make a replacement, but it would never be the same pitch, so he'd have to rewrite the parts. Interesting. Okay, so I'm interested in authenticity. I want to be as close to Harry Parts right. as possible. Right. And there's a picture of him in 1952 with his bowls. Now, we were just getting ready to perform and record platform percussion dances. Right. And I wanted the pitches to be exactly right. Mm -hmm. So I blew up the picture. I knew exactly what a full bowl, how long that was. Okay. And I took a little protractor and looked at the exact percentages and figured out exactly how long each bowl was supposed to be. So proud of myself. I took the bowls down to the glass cutter. I wanted exactly 14 millimeters, and this is exactly. They finally came back. I strung them up. Now, Harry was very careful to write what the pitches were for his bowls. Right. So I said, oh, here's three and a half. This should be exactly a C sharp. And it wasn't even close. But it was exactly <laughs> the same length. And then I tried another one. Well, this is supposed to be. No. No. What did I do wrong? Then I did this. I actually looked. Yeah, the gauge of the, at the instrument the thickness mm -hmm. and compared them one bowl to the next. None of them were the same thickness. Yeah. Oh, they were the right shape on the outside, right. but not on the inside, which means, uh, oh boy. So I ended up having to do exactly what Harry did. We just put them in, I lined them all up and put them from low to high, and we've used them that way ever since. So after the cutting, there's no way to adjust the intonation. There's no fine tuning that can take place the way that it can on a marimba bowl. Yes, yes, oh, there, there is. is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's called a... a, a grazing plate or something like that. It's, uh -huh. a, it's an industrial thing. Sure. It's a large ship where you put gravel in there and it vibrates. Uh, and those machines to rent... Uh, oh, thousands of dollars. It's thousands of dollars. Sure. Thousands of dollars. Sure. Yeah. And we decided it was good enough for Harry. <laughs> it's good enough for us. I mean, it sort of harks back to, again, instrument construction. And as a percussionist, I'm always thinking about these instruments. I mean, you probably know this already, but Harry Parch is one of the great luminary figures in the world of contemporary percussion and and became one of those figures that it's it's almost a rite of passage mm. to get into harry parch's music and start looking at the way that he treated percussion instruments alongside his string instruments and the, the way that this all worked right um so from just a construction standpoint of course we're always thinking about the mass of the object that we're tuning. Mm. So it's not just about the size, the length, and the shape of the bar, but also the density of the bar, yeah. the weight and the mass that really impacts the intonation. And Harry, you know, he was not an expert instrument builder. He was somebody who was figuring out as he went and learning yeah. through the process, like any percussionist does. You find an object, you like the way it sounds, now it's time to manipulate it to fit within this other world that you're creating. So, trial by fire. These are some of the pitches. Literally that by fire. Exactly. So, 
Give us a demonstration of, of from high to low what these bowls sound like. Well, what, what's really intriguing about them too is you think, well, you hit something and it has one sound in it. Mm. These don't. Each bowl has two prominent notes. Sure. Ball, ba, or ball, ba. <laughs> it's, it's a perfect, it's a major 10. It's a little chord, which is really lovely. Mm. Same harmonic is up there, right? And everything's dropping. Mm. So they're all approximately a major 10, which is lovely. But when you start playing them together, spend a lot of my time behind the cloud chamber but it's like right, another instrument right, I play. Right. So let's talk about the technique a little bit. Well there are two different basic two different tones here. There's of course the edge tone. Mm -hmm. But Harry also used the tops. Right. And interesting there's a harmonic relationship there too. Yeah, right? Right. That harmonic relationship is different. Yeah, right. Well, the mass of this is different. The depth is a little different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, as a percussionist, it's all about the mallets too, because of course, if I go like this, right, that's one tone. One You've tone. got a very soft mallet there. Yeah. This one is a little more articulate, right? And then here, just to kind of show the full range of, I don't want to really lay into that. Yeah, you that's, can tell it's different. Yeah. This is not a real hard polyball mallet. This is, gosh, what even model number this? Oh, this is the Musser M2. Yeah, so this is an unwrapped M2. And that's bright. Did Harry ever write for a mallet quite this bright? No. Well, I don't think we've encountered no, that in any no. other guitar. But what we do find in the, in the literature, in the parts themselves, probably the players that said, use the hard blue sticks here. Right. Or the black, now, this is, you know, what, decades later, maybe some yeah. companies that are blue are no longer, they knew what that meant. Any right. mallet player knows what that meant. That's similar with Steve Reich's band in New York. Use the yellow mallets. <laughs> they, Who's they, yellow mallets? They all have the same set of mallets that they kind of get, got in Steve Well, Reich's so we've got the top tone. Guess what? That doesn't work when they have necks. Oh, yeah. That's just not resonant at all. So right. for these guys, with the, are the tops, you really only need to use the side. Now you can also... Sure. That sort of thing. But the, so there's two basic tones. There's tops and there's sides. Now, back in 2016, we did a project with the Prism Saxophone Quartet where we premiered two new pieces by two different composers, uh, Stratis Minikakis from MIT yes. and Ken Ueno from UC Berkeley. And I remember on Ken's piece, do you remember this? It was the harmonics from the tenor saxophone or was it Barry? Oh, it was one of the deeper ones, probably yeah. a tenor. Yeah. Where he was sticking his bell underneath Yeah, there. the bell right in there to see if we can activate tones from the bowls through sympathetic resonance. Uh, to what degree of success did we achieve with that effect? It didn't work so well. Yeah, it was, it was a little rough. too heavy. However, I wasn't that one of the pieces where they actually bowed the edge. Yes. Yeah. Because so uh, there's another sound. Right. Of course, that's something after the 1950s, people started bowing everything. Bowing everything. Yeah. Symbols, whatever. The so, extended technique vocabulary of percussion applies of to these directly. We were talking about bowing a little bit. What does bowing sound like on these instruments? Uh, does it work? Sci-fire. <laughs> yeah, what we like from bowed instruments and the timbre that it gives us, right? Yeah. So, um, does it work on all the bowl? Let's see. That uh, just is just a nasty little squeak on that. 
they're your, that's a lot more fundamental than that. You know, you can manipulate the bow with lateral pressure. I sort of do that with the middle finger a little bit. You kind of lift into the object a bit. Right? And if you come off and with maybe not quite so much pressure on that, You can sort of manipulate it and it's grab a good phrase. harmonics, yeah. And when you you'll feel the bow bite mm. when you grab certain harmonics and you can hold them. Yeah. It's kind of part yeah. of the fun of it. But well, this has been really fantastic. I think that we've talked about a lot of things. Anything else you want to add about these guys? Really, uh, we're not done yet. Okay. What do we do next? Turns out that uh, Harry himself, this is the 1952 setup. But over the years, he added bowls. So there are four here, three here, four here, three here, and another four down oh, at the bottom. Oh, my goodness. A full rank. Wow. So as we move on, we, we've sort of been recapitulating his, his compositions in chronological order. Right. And when we get a new instrument, we have new new pieces we can play. Right. So now uh, we're starting to approach pieces to say, no, no, we don't need 11 bowls. We need 14 bowls for this. So mm -hmm. it's time to start shopping again. Excellent. Fun stuff. What did you guys think? Drop us a line. You can come to our website, which is parch.la. You can direct message us anywhere. Uh, we certainly want to thank our friends at LA Percussion Rentals for giving us this great space to set up, do a little bit of playing, and thanks to you guys for tuning in. John, thank you for your knowledge. Until next time. Until next time.